Let's take a peer back into the not too distant history to see what we can learn from the 2009 H1N1 swine flu pandemic as compared to the current COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Dr. David Park and I am the Dean of the Southern Utah campus of Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine. In this brief video, we'll look at some numbers, we'll look at some dates on when things transpired, and we'll also look at some theoretical projections for COVID-19. There's been a lot of public sentiment about the perceived extreme response to the COVID-19 pandemic compared to the swine flu pandemic. So let's take a look at some of these numbers here. In a six-month time frame to the H1N1, there were almost 4,000 deaths. Now, in half that time, in three months, the number of deaths for COVID-19 was 11.5 times higher, greater than 45,000. Now, what about the one-year mark of the uh, swine flu pandemic. Well, in 12 month time frame, 12,469 compared to the 45,000. Now, what about the entire 2018 2019 influenza season, which includes all of viruses, including the H1N1 now? Well, now the estimated death here for total is a little over 34,000. Still small compared to the 45,000 deaths in just a three month time period. We know that the transmissibility and the virulence of COVID-19 of SARS coronavirus 2 is significantly higher than the H1N1 that caused the swine flu. The R0 for H1N1 back then for the novel virus was 1.5, meaning that one person could infect up to 1.5 people. And for the SARS coronavirus 2, the R0 is 5.7, significantly higher, meaning one person could infect up to six people. The doubling time for the H1N1 globally was estimated to be about 15 days. Doubling time for COVID was seven days uh, globally. And in the U.S., while there are no doubling time figures for H1N1, it is expected to be about two days. So that is why the cases are growing so rapidly and uh, it is such a dangerous infection. Looking at the orange line for coronavirus compared to the blue line, this is a similar trajectory when it comes to the confirmed cases. But this is where things differ. If you're looking at the confirmed deaths, spike very high exponential growth for deaths, while for H1N1, it is a slow growing plateauing type of a curve. At a national briefing session, a recommended guidelines that was issued to states to start reopening their economy was once they started seeing a trend of 14 days of declining reported cases of COVID-19. This graph shows the cumulative cases in the U.S. as of April 20, and once we start seeing a declining number of case reports, we should see a flattening of this curve with the trend continuing for 14 days before social distancing restrictions are lifted. If you've been watching the news, you've seen a lot of finger pointing to different agencies and governments and countries of how they responded to these pandemics. But let's just take a look at the actual dates comparing these two pandemics. The first case in the United States was reported in April 15 in California from a suspected case coming from Mexico. The first confirmed case of COVID-19 was in Washington state in a man who had traveled from Wuhan, China on January 21. The United States CDC reported the novel H1N1 virus to the WHO on April 18th. Uh, it was three days after they had identified it. And according to the news reports, China, once they identified a novel coronavirus, identified it to WHO four days. The CDC activates the Emergency Operations Center seven days after the first U.S. case of H1N1 and for the COVID on the same day as the first U.S. case. The WHO declares a public health emergency of international concern on April uh, 25 and for COVID, January 30, which was 11 days after the first U.S. case. The U.S. Health and Human Services declares a public health emergency 11 days after the first U.S. case and similarly 10 days after the first U.S. case for COVID. Here's where we see a potential significant discrepancy when schools start to close. 
for the swine flu. Two days after the public health emergency was announced, schools started to close. But for COVID, it was 42 days after the public health emergency announcement. For the swine flu, the first wave peaked the United States seven weeks after the first U.S. case. And this red is not accurate. It is a comparative assumption that it would have happened on March 10, which would have been seven weeks after the first U.S. case. The WHO declares the pandemic um, on June 11, and that was six weeks after it had declared a public health emergency of international concern. And that is also the same amount of period for COVID-19. President Obama declares a national emergency 24 weeks after the Health and Human Services declares a public health emergency, and President Trump declares a national emergency just six weeks after the public health emergency declaration. By the time it hit all 50 states, it was nine weeks after the first U.S. case for H1N1, and similarly, eight weeks after the first U.S. case for, for COVID-19. Now, trials of vaccine testing started 12 weeks after a public health emergency was announced, and about half that time for COVID, six weeks after that declaration. The first available vaccines for mass ordering occurred 21 weeks after clinical trials started. And once again, this number is not accurate because we are hearing reports that it will take 12 to 18 months to develop a vaccine for COVID. But if we were going by the assumptions of H1N1, 21 weeks after clinical tests started would be August. And when will it end? Well, the WHO announces the end of the pandemic 14 months after it had declared it. This should say 2010. For COVID, that means 14 months from January 21 would be May 1 of 2021 in next year. Now, I want to take you back further into history to look at the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. This chart represents the actual timeline graph of what happened in Denver. You can see here the spike of the first wave going up with a lot of cases and deaths. The effects of the first interventions, which had a positive effect, and we saw a decline in the number of deaths. And then when the interventions were prematurely removed, once again, another second wave occurs with a spike and a peak higher than the initial first wave. Now, could there be a history lesson here for us? Unfortunately, a lot of pressure is being placed on our leaders around the country today due to the spiking numbers of unemployment and the economic devastation that has occurred from the implementation of the strict social distancing uh, guidelines. And what we need to be careful of is this potential, this theoretical uh, projection timeline. If we see a spike occurring very soon toward the end of this month or even May 1 and a decline of those numbers and we prematurely go back to work and open up the economy, there is a potential second wave that we will likely see. And then as additional social distancing measures are placed, we'll see another decline. And if schools begin to reopen on this time, there is a potential third wave that we must all consider. This timeline is an example of what we want to avoid. I would guess that many of you who are watching are probably wondering, when will the COVID-19 pandemic end and when can we return to normal life? To answer this, I believe there are two things we really need. One, we need more time. We need more time to gather more data and evidence and to develop better testing solutions and to develop better treatments and ultimately a safe and effective vaccine. And two, we need more patience. We need more patience for our leaders to develop good strategic plans so they are able to make the best decisions with reliable information in a smart, structured way. Sir Winston Churchill is often quoted to say, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I believe this is a good piece of wisdom we should all follow.